Today's podcast is presented by Podgo. Podgo is the easiest way for you to monetize your podcast, providing podcasters with a flat rate for ad space so you always know how much you get when you include an ad from Podgo. I recently joined as a member, and you can too. Apply today to become a member and immediately be connected with advertisers that fit your audience. That's podgo.co at P-O-D-G-O dot C-O. When you become a member, enter Suburban Folk in the podcast that you heard about them. Today's episode is also presented by Sweat Connected. Sweat Connected is a transformative way to work out. Sweat Connected has a mission to help you feel your best. Each expert instructor brings their signature method directly to you wherever you are in the world via Zoom. When you take a Sweat Connected class, you are able to interact with your instructor and the other participants in the class just like you would in a live studio experience. Whether you have been a group fitness participant for years or are newer, you will feel at home with Sweat Connected. Sweat Connected is exclusively offering our listeners 50% off their first class by going to sweatconnected.com and using the code POD, that's POD, P-O-D, at sweatconnected.com for 50% off your first class. Sweat Connected, for all levels, all ages, all sizes, and all humans. We're also brought to you by State Bags. State Bags makes beautifully well-made, inclusively cool products while using the power of business to give back to shift the narrative around social injustice. For every State Bag purchased, State hand-delivers a backpack packed with essential tools for success to an American child in need. But their commitment goes beyond simply a material donation. State Bags has your back. And part of that commitment is making a difference in local kids' lives. To get you ready for your commute or wherever you are traveling next, State is offering our listeners 15% off their next purchase at statebags.com. Using the code POD, that's 15% off your next purchase using the code POD, P-O-D, at statebags.com. State Bags, they have your back. And finally, we are brought to you by Hugh Kitchen. Hugh is a family-founded chocolate and snacking company focused on creating products that match ultra-simple ingredients with unbeatable taste. Built on a strong mission to help people get back to human, Hugh only uses simple, real, and responsibly sourced ingredients. Hugh obsessively vets every ingredient to unite unbeatable taste with unmatched simplicity. They go beyond what is easy and expected to ensure that their products and practices are ethical and put both humanity and the human body first. All of Hugh's products are gluten-free, dairy-free, refined sugar-free, and aren't heavily processed. Use code POD for 15% off your next purchase at HughKitchen.com. That's code POD, P-O-D, for 15% off at HughKitchen.com. And find out why Hugh helps people get back to human. Health, parenting, finance, travel, and home improvement. This is the Suburban Folk Podcast. Welcome to the Suburban Folk Podcast. I'm Greg Rotersheimer, your host. With everything that's gone on in 2020, it seems like we're constantly in uncharted territory. We don't know if or when we'll end up back to where we were before the pandemic. So the question comes up, have we faced similar issues before? My guest is Sinia Curran Finfer. She is the author of the book Confessions of a Helmet-Free Childhood, where she tells stories of her youth growing up in the late 60s and early 70s, which, of course, was also a tumultuous time. So we're going to discuss what parallels there are between what we're facing now, as well as new challenges that our children are facing and how we can help them cope with their day-to-day challenges based on our experiences. Thanks, Inia, for joining me today. Can you kick us off by giving your background and then what ultimately led to you writing the book, Confessions of a Helmet-Free Childhood? Certainly. Hi, good morning. Uh, what I wanted to do with this book was basically capture the epic tales of my childhood. I am number two of four girls. I was born in New York City in 1960, but I had an unusual childhood in that my father had a career that had him bouncing around uh, from New York, Detroit, Minneapolis, Cleveland, and Chicago. What translated for me with that was I went to five different grade schools, uh, three different high schools. Um, so uh, change was my constant. Um, the other thing I wanted to do was just capture this unusual time of being a kid um, in the late 60s, early 70s, because 
I see so many parallels as what with what is going on. You had the Vietnam War, you had the rise of feminism, there were all kinds of things changing. And what I crystallized that in is it was sort of old fashioned, fun, yet space age opportunities. We were being presented with some very interesting things. The reason why I wrote the book, my background is marketing communications. I started out in a PR firm. I worked both in agency and on the client side, and then became self-employed as a marketing consultant. We sold our house in 2018. It moved way faster than we thought it would. And when we moved into our new town, um, which is in the Coachella Valley, we had about a two and a half month lull between the time we moved out of our old house and could move into our new place. And it was a hundred degrees plus every day. So I'm like, you know what? Th- if not now, when? So the framework of the book was to take 13 epic stories from my childhood, and I call them confessions of a helmet-free childhood because we didn't wear helmets then. And basically, though the stories are personal, I think the appeal of them are universal. Just goofy things kids do and the lessons learned along the way. I think that's probably what we will have our comparisons of what ties each one of the stories together. Is that evident in either your writing process or as the reader goes through certain characteristics or behaviors that you think are universal for all kids? And also, which ones do you think maybe will stay in that time and place of late 60s, early 70s? And which ones do you still see in kids today? Well, again, I was really trying to go for universal appeal, but also to capture what it was like to be a kid because I have a big birthday coming up and I have two children, uh, one who turned 23 and one who's about to turn 21. And I wanted to capture what was the same and what was not the same. And I think every age has its sensibility. I mean, my mother's childhood was different than mine. My childhood is different than my daughter's. But I think the universalness of it is that children operate on impulses. You just say, okay, I think I'm going to take my sister's bike out for a ride. It'll be okay. I'll be back in two minutes. And I had an epic crash and totally scraped myself up, but destroyed my sister's bike. So I was in big trouble. That could have happened to my mother. That could have happened to me. That could have happened to my uh, daughter. I think what changes are the circumstances. And so what I tried to do with this book, and I mean, it's it's a very light book. This is only like 60 pages, but things like I lied my way into getting a kitten, destroyed my friend's doll. I stole the neighbor's fireworks. I set the fondue cat on fire. And no, I wasn't a sociopath as a kid. If I wrote a book about, and she did her homework, brushed her teeth and went to bed, no one would want to read that book. It's supposed to be a funny look back at the foibles of being a kid and, and trying to find your way. So I think I think each of them, if it doesn't relate exactly to what my mom's childhood or my daughter's childhood was, it definitely relates to certain things that kids have to navigate. The other thing that I've been surprised is that men really like this book, both men my own age, but also I have uh, younger cousins and also my cousins have children. And they laugh out loud, one, because, hey, look, Sinia wasn't an angel. (laughs) Who knew? But also things like I was in an epic food fight in eighth grade, and I don't think they happen on the level that they used to happen. I mean, it was like a prison brawl, and I ended up getting hit in the eye with an apple so hard it knocked me out of my chair and onto the floor, and I had quite a shiner. The thing that's interesting about that food fight is that he wasn't aiming for me. He just tossed the apple Uh, This one kid who was big, strong kid in my class just threw it. I was in the line of fire. So, I mean, I think the way that was resolved was basically with the teachers and the kids. If that happened now, it would be a federal offense. We'd have to, you know, lawyers would probably be involved and, and there would be a social media component to it. So I think there's both components to each of these stories that were specific to that era, but also universal in like, how do you deal with that? I mean, my feeling with this kid was... I wasn't mad at him because our eyes never met. I saw him wind up. He threw the apple and sort of like a cartoon that you would see on Saturday where the the small speck becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. I can still remember in my mind's eye, this apple coming at me fast and I couldn't move out of the way. It struck me. And I, the next thing I remember, I was looking up at the ceiling of the cafeteria. One thing I will pick up there is where you said even people that you know say, oh, you're not an angel. Uh, And for me with really young kids, that translates to the realization I'm going to have to have that the years of me knowing exactly what my kids are doing on a regular basis are very, very limited. (laughs) But then that goes to some of the universality of freedom and a sense of exploration. 
like with the bike. Heck, my son's not even six yet. And he had a bit of a crash to where I was like, man, that could have gone a different way. And we could have been taking a trip to the hospital. So there's certainly some universality with that. Now, do you think, let's stick with the food fight example. And you're right, gosh, depending on how that would unfold, there could be police at the school. Now there would be. And I think the thing was, what was interesting in the food fight was like, you know, we start, it, I was sitting at the table. It's, I didn't see who started it, but I saw what started it because some French, you know, some French fries went flying over us and ketchup droplets went all the way across the, the table that my girlfriends and I were sitting at. And we're like, oh, that's not good. That was uh, responded to with like cups of soft ice cream and stuff. And then it just became a melee. It's kind of exciting and it's kind of horrifying all at the same time. And it just escalated. And I was sitting in the wrong chair. This guy was not looking to take Cynia out. But I remember that, you know, the scuffle of the chairs and the lunchroom monitor, who did this? What happened? And I knew exactly who did it, but I did not squeal on him. One, because I didn't want retribution, but really in my middle school brain, I was thinking, you know what? This was an accident. He didn't mean to hurt me. And I'm not going to have him get into super big trouble over this because it, it wasn't malicious. I was unfortunately in the wrong place at the wrong time. I think the thing that parents have to balance is giving kids some autonomy and some unstructured play, allowing them to struggle through things. I mean, and I would say supervise the struggle uh, one degree apart, because if you swoop in and you fix it, they don't learn anything. They have to learn through the struggle. Um, One of my cousins has a daughter whose two little friends were very unpleasant to her. Your mother bear thing, you want to swoop in and call the parents and Susie said this and what are you going to do about it? And you know what? She was really smart. She just stood back and said, you know, well, that was pretty crummy. What are you going to do about it? And sometimes kids make really strange choices, but if they're okay with it and the other kids are okay with it, I think you need to let it stand. The word you mentioned was exactly what I was thinking, autonomy. Now, of course, there is a very heavy emphasis nowadays about bullying. And I know I had a story or two that I can remember when I hear that word. What do you think the balance is there of allowing kids to solve their own problems and figure things out socially, but being careful that it doesn't get too far. It's all a function of a degree. There is no gold standard. But like one of my other stories is that I stood up to a, a bus route bully um, and the dynamics were my older sister had a friend coming home from school. They were good friends. So I was sitting behind them and my sister was sitting at the window of the bus and Liz was on the aisle and who, Herbie, who was sort of a known character, just started teasing her. You know how like some boys just get into it. And I first just kind of watched it, but then he doubled down on her and her face turned flush and I saw one tear track down her flushed cheek from where I was sitting and I lost it and said, hey, leave her alone. And to my horror, of course, he just thought the energy shifted to me. It's like, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> and I had nothing. And he said, you want to fight about it? And I stupidly said, yes. And we weren't going to get into it on the bus because when you do something on school time, it's a whole different thing than if you do it in your own yard. He squared off with me at the bus stop. And I said, I got to go home and change my clothes because, you know, there that's an olden thing. You had school clothes and you had play clothes. So I went home, changed into a danskin uh, mock turtleneck and pull up pants because that was the look of the day and stomped down to his house. And his older brother who knew me because I was, you know, neighborhood kids who was in high school opened the door uh, to pipsqueak me and said, hi, what, what's up, Zinnia? And I said, well, I'm here to fight Herbie. And of course, he thought that was hilarious, but stifled a thing and said, okay, hold on. And so he, he looks over his shoulder and says, uh, Herbie, um, Cynia is here to fight you, delighting in watching the whole thing. And Herbie kind of looked at me, rolled his eyes, and you know he was watching TV. And I realized in that moment, oh my gosh, if I had let this ride, like he had totally forgotten about this curve. Buffle, but I was a, a woman of my convictions of fifth grade and was going to see this through. And I just figured going down there, well, you know, I'll probably get a punch or two and that'll be over, but like I've done my thing. So he w walks out and steps down off the concrete patio into the lawn. And I remember thinking, oh, good, this is going to go on, happen on grass instead of the concrete. This will be better. And so he sort of squared off with me and he leaned into me and just said, get off my lawn, bitch, and stomped off. And of course, you know, that's a big bad word in fifth grade. I was like, holy smokes. But he didn't touch me. He just stomped off and shut the door. And I think in Herbie's fifth grade brain, he was like, this would not be a good look if I deck a girl on our front lawn. Like there's going to be 
hell to pay for this, but I'm not going to let it ride. So this is what he said and walked. So I think it was sort of detente. He felt like he stood his ground. I felt like I stood his ground and, and we moved along. But again, I don't think I would have done that if I didn't know Herbie. Herbie lived three doors down. So I had a sense of him. I mean, just some big old sixth grader on the bus. I might have been like, I think we'll just let this ride and I'll give Liz a hug when we get to the bus stop. So I think it's a case by case basis. But I will say that my kids, when they went through grade school, there was much more sensitivity training, for lack of a better term. But they established one physical personal space, which was not a concept when I was a kid. Unless they're a good friend or someone you've invited, that's your personal space. And also separating behavior from the kid. Like you can have a nice kid who just does a really jerky thing, but you learn like that's not okay was the operative phrase in my kids preschool. And that was so liberating for me as a parent that like, you you know, I love you to death, but, you know, pushing your sister down the stairs, that's not okay. And there are consequences with that action. So again, I think the fact that neither my parents knew about this, neither Herbie's parents didn't know and this was a standoff between two kids on a front lawn. I don't know if that would happen right now because kids are so much more supervised and so much more structured. But at the same time, it went down. And I mean, we also walked it off. It, w- it was done. Whereas I think the problem with social media now is these these kerfuffles, and that's really all it was, this would have had a life of its own. What I wanted to do was go on record going like, you were lousy to her for absolutely no reason. That's no not okay. And I'm calling it, calling it out. What he said to me was the equivalent of today's, you're not the boss of me and stomped off. But you know what? He never bothered Liz again. You said the magic word, which in the world of bullying for me, which is boss, <laughs> there must be something about what well, I know there is, right? It's for the kids that are prone to, well, pick on other kids. The only adult is trying to drive a vehicle and can't really supervise everything that's going on. And actually the most prominent bullying experience I can remember for myself was on the bus. And to your point about social media, yeah, I very much remember when this particular kid wouldn't be on the bus for the day, I'd have this sense of relief and then vice versa. Once he's getting off the bus for the day, that was it. Well, I can't imagine that continuing to go on in the world of social media, which is basically what's going on even when you go home, if you're using, if the kid is using their devices and so on and so forth, those circles are still happening. That person has access to you even when you've closed the door to presumably what should be your safest place, your home. So uh, I, I think that is very true and is something that's extra concerning about um, social media. And Gosh, the other thing about the bus now for me being the parent is that helpless feeling, right? Of yes, you need to let the child be able to be autonomous. But uh, actually, for example, I did a little bit of research uh, for my oldest. Now he's just in kindergarten, so just starting around like bus and, and things like that. And one of the things that stood out if you were having a really, really persistent problem is find other modes of transportation, which made me so mad because it's like, if I'm not the one with the kid that's causing the problem, why should I be the one that's inconvenienced in finding something else? I I tend to agree. And I think the thing is, is that I think what you need is sort of a, uh, a ground rules. And so then it's not Herbie's a bad kid and, and character assassination. It's the rule is, you know, if you don't like somebody, fine, but everyone's entitled to a pleasant commute, for lack of a better term. So, you know, the understanding is keep the conversation neutral on the bus. You want to have a kerfuffle at home, that's on your time. But I, I think that they've done a better job on that. I, and again, I think the other thing is that you have to understand that kids are resilient and they do walk it off. Sometimes parents get too involved too early. And you know what? It's a case by case basis. I think you can tie yourself in knots going, I need this nice clear rule that I will stick by through thick and thin. And life just isn't like that. And so I think the thing that I I think kids need is to know that I'm behind you. I'll hear it, but also understand that your kid isn't an angel. And maybe your kid was the Herbie on the bus. And that I think that's we we focus too much on punishing the bully instead of unpacking the bully and saying, okay, where is this coming from? Now, I know with Herbie, he had a very angry dad. Stuff rolls downhill. And so being at home probably wasn't very pleasant for Herbie. And so there was some anger there and it 
it manifested itself on the bus, making things unpleasant for other people. Maybe that's how he processed it. I don't want to overthink it because this is a light book, but I, I would say to parents, understand that your kid is not always going to be on the receiving end. Sometimes your kid's dishing it out and you have to figure out how to navigate that. And I think also most kids just want to have their day in court. I had a situation where my son was in a gym class and a kid missed a play. He took up his flag football belt and slammed it to the ground, but not before uh, catching the side of my son's face. And it hurt and it left a mark. And I asked a very, very pointed question to my son saying, was he aiming for you or were you just in range? And he said, I was in range. I said, it's still not okay. It's not okay to throw sports equipment because, hey, someone could get hurt and you're the person who got hurt. So we had sort of a kangaroo court with the two parents. And again, I get it. He was mad. He was disappointed. He was angry. But the rule is you can't throw around sports equipment because people get hurt and someone got hurt. Do we get this? I mean, I sound like, you know, Moses in that I was very upset at the time, but I think that's the thing you have to understand. And at the same time, my daughter was unpleasant to a girl at school and we had to sit down and say, well, what is that about? And okay, I guess I can't expect you to like everyone, but everyone's entitled to have a pleasant day. So if this is someone you don't enjoy, either distance yourself or make yourself absent because, you know, we can't get along with everyone, but it's not your job to police everyone. I'm just continuing to check off the list of things that we've already experienced for my kindergartner. And to, to frame that up, actually, we've done a number of episodes around virtual school and so on. And uh, we actually opted to go to a private school that's a little further out uh, in the rural area that is able to go five days a week. So he doesn't have to do like long distance learning. But That's hard for kindergartners. I agree. Yeah. But what you're mentioning, we've, I won't tell all of his stories because, <laughs> you know, later years, he would be super embarrassed. Yeah, exactly. But, but you're, you're hitting a lot of those points. Uh, we had a issue f- for recess where he, this was the second day and he got an email sent to us uh, about an incident that he had had. And we had to go through all those exact conversations of like, why are you saying this? Why are you this or that? Well, I, and also it has to be age appropriate. Um, my son had a kerfuffle in preschool. Well, like he doesn't, he's not verbally capable to do anything. But so I said, you have to draw Max an I'm sorry picture. And you have to, you know, and draw whatever you want to draw because he's preschool and it's basically a scribble. But I said, you hand it to him and say, this is my I'm sorry picture. So that there was consequences for what he did and that he had to make amends and that Max had to accept his amends. Now, you know, we are talking about middle school. You're talking about high school. It's a whole different set of circumstances. But happily, there's a lot of people whose entire life is dedicated to what's age appropriate for this. But I think the thing is, is that both if your kid is on the receiving end, they should have a voice. But also if they're, you know, when, when things go down, the first question is to say, what happened? And listen, because sometimes... Uh, you know, there's been situations where somebody has really taken it out on another kid, but then you find out the kid who's on the receiving end has been just awful to the kid who swung or kicked or whatever for months. Not that that makes it right, but it puts it in a different context. An example of that, uh, going back to the bus, it, sort of unpacking it, uh, my son came home and said, oh, so-and-so was sharing their fruit snacks out of their lunch. And I'm like, they were? Why were they? And first, <laughs> I'm always super skeptical about the intentions of any kid. And of course, he's the youngest. So, you know, I'm, I'm even more careful about it. So I'm like, well, did somebody do something to these fruit snacks were they on the floor? Well, no, they were from so-and-so other person's lunchbox. Okay, did the other person actually willingly want their fruit snacks to be distributed to everyone? And then he started to get a little bit fuzzy and and actually it goes back to what you're saying of, of standing up for other kids. I'm like, if somebody took somebody else's lunchbox and starts taking food out and giving it to everybody else on the bus thinking that's funny, like that's not okay. <laughs> at the very least, yeah, at the very least you don't participate and gosh, I'd be really proud if you stood up and said get away from that other kid and leave him alone. Uh, so, an example of that unpacking that you're talking about even right out of the gate for these elementary school kids. They said don't ask how was school today because that's like asking how was June. You know, I mean, so much happens that, you know, well, I used to, I would get it in, in aggregate. I'd say like, so, you know, how did math go? Cause they were having problems with math or, Hey, is Chase still in a case cat, uh, cast on his arm? Or, Hey, I heard, um, so-and-so was getting a new puppy. Did the new puppy happen? You know, bits and pieces because they cannot say, okay, for first period, this happened. And then at lunch that, I mean, it's just, 
their day is vast in their brain. And uh, the other thing I used to say is that when they first come home, it's cocktail hour. They've had to be on their best behavior that they have an hour to like have a snack, watch TV, play with a dog, whatever it is. They have to decompress because they've had to be, they've had to have their game face on for, you know, six hours and, and they just need to decompress. But that's when you get all the news. It's when they sort of unravel and say, oh yeah, and get a load of the, you know, and so-and-so has a girlfriend or so-and-so, you know, got a new skateboard or whatever. You hear the headline news and, and it's interesting to see what the other head, what their headline news is. The other th- moment that you get so much information is when you're driving your kids around with a friend to something else because they forget. You become the chauffeur. Very good to leave the, the radio on low just so it creates a little audio wallpaper Paper. But I mean, I have learned so much driving kids either to a movie or to a practice or whatever, because they forget you're there and the news flows. I'll keep that in mind once uh, <laughs> they, they get a little more complicated, I guess, in their day to day lives. Well, let's back up again a little bit just to your experiences in the stories, uh, late 60s, early 70s. Has the feedback been from others growing up at the same time that they had similar kinds of stories? Did anything that you experienced? Yes, absolutely. I, 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 I've said that like one of my goals with this book is in telling my stories, I wanted to get people to tell their own stories. And I've heard so many stories about destroying a bike. I've heard so many water balloon fights are a huge thing in our, in our, uh, life. And also like party games. Um, pin the tail on the donkey was like a standard. So is musical chairs. Musical chairs has kind of fallen out of favor because it's a very physical game. The nature of our toys. I mean, our toys were very simple, you, you know, uh, a jump rope, a swing set, a bicycle, maybe you drew hopscotch. There was a much more, it was a much more physical childhood and it was a much more tied to nature. I mean, I, we lived uh, in suburban Michigan and Minnesota and I would go with either with a friend or by myself and walk into the woods and maybe you made a fort or maybe you just, you know, put rocks in a creek to see what would happen. Um, but there was this sort of space out time that was available. I think that is being lost. And part of it is that, you know, I wouldn't encourage anyone, oh, you let your five year old wander into the woods by themselves. But I think you could strike a, a, a balance with that. I think the other thing that shapes a childhood is just what's going on in the world. I mean, men landed on the moon when I was in grade school. That was astounding. We were asked to start to learn the metric system. We still, America still hasn't absorbed that, but I was the first generation of grade school. Like, um, you know, there's this other way of measuring and you should really, you know, get it under your belt. And then the gizmos of the world. I mean, now I'm going to sound like Moses talking about things like this, but the garage door opener was an incredible increase of that uh, quality in my life because it, you know i'm one of four what would happen mom would pull in the driveway and one of the two big girls would have to go out and pull the garage door open the electric can opener okay that is a fabulous thing if, if anyone who's wrestled with a handheld especially if you're little you know it, it ends up you know spinning onto the counter and you've got chef boyardee all over the counter the other thing was the calculator this was a big deal um because first they were very expensive my dad had one in the office and he brought it home over the weekend to show us what a calculator was and that was so cool and then there was a big discussion once i was in middle school can you use a calculator for a test it, because the argument was you had to know the equation in order to use a calculator. So if you didn't know that, you know, you might as well have a rock on your desk. It's not going to help you out. But my father, who had a career in finance, was like, you know, you're making people mentally lazy. You should be able to figure out 17% interest over 32 months. (laughs) So, So again, I think what I'm saying is our kids are dealing with different changes. Like my my daughter bemoaned the closing of Blockbuster Video because that was a social thing. We'd like, you know, on a Friday, oh, let's go get, a, you know, three or four VHSs for the weekend. Well, it wasn't only the joy of going, you know, wandering through the the titles and figuring out what you want, but guess what? You'd run into your friends and then, you know, they'd try to work us for some um, red licorice or some popcorn on the way out. And when that closed, she was like, oh my gosh, you know, like my kids will never know what going to the Blockbuster was all about. I had a friend whose grandfather's great delight was he'd pull up in his pickup and say, who wants to go to Dairy Queen? I'm treating. And we'd all jump into the payload of his truck, not t- tied down in any ma- way, shape or form. And he'd take 12 of us to the Dairy Queen and not buy us all a single serve swirly cone. We'd you know eat that with delight. And then he'd drop us off at the corner. He picked us up. If an older gentleman picked up 12 children and drove off, it would be on the nightly news. Going back to the Blockbuster example, even What's happening now, I know 
my friends would go to the mall and hang out there. And it sure seems like we are witnessing the death of the indoor mall very, very quickly. And now this will change a little bit after we're on the back end of COVID. But sitting at a family style restaurant where they don't serve alcohol and you're allowed to actually be there, for example, somewhere else that we would hang out quite a bit. So you're running out of just what could possibly be a common hangout. And then for the technology part, you're hitting on something that I've been reading lately. Actually, one of the last books that I finished was talking about this need for producing things at all time. Like It's almost like it's bad now to have any downtime. Do you feel that as well compared to kind of past childhoods and where we're at now? Absolutely. I mean, in that, um, you know, my kids could walk home from school. We live two blocks from, so I was really glad that they had that. But when I was a kid, I mean, even as young as second grade, um, I would say, let me think, one, two, three, four. It was like four blocks away, sort of a zigzag. You know, you went east, you went south, you went east, you went south to get to my grade school. And, you know, I walked with my sister and as you walk towards school, there was more of a cluster, but there were no parents involved. And then when we came home, I didn't have to come straight home. I mean, we were sort of the be home before the sun went down because that was roughly when dinner was served. It was okay for me to stop at a friend's house and like have milk and cookies and talk to their mom or play with someone's dog or maybe my friend's older brother was washing the car. And so we kind of helped in quotes, help that process. And then you came home and my mom was not uptight about us not being home 15 minutes after we walked. I would have freaked out if my kids came an hour and 15 minutes later. I think that's... That's just sensibilities change. And so I think um, it'll be interesting to see as my children have children. I think it's a function of where you live if you're in an urban setting versus a suburban. But I always marveled when I was in New York City, I would see clusters of middle schoolers on the subway. And I, I you know, I asked because I, I look like a mom, so they'll talk to me. But I said, you know, what's the deal? How does that work? And they're like, oh, we go to PS, you know, 147 on, you know, this street. And so the five of us get on on this street. And then we know that, you know, these other kids, you know, they know the schedule of the subway. And they did it. And I mean, I marveled at it because they were perfectly comfortable being on the subway, but also it's sort of critical mass. That's when it's rush hour. People are going to work. People are going to school. And you start getting a sense of who's supposed to be on the car at 745 in the morning versus, you know, you wouldn't do this. You wouldn't let seventh graders go at 10 o'clock at night. And I think the same thing happened in our neighborhood that kids school got out at about 230, quarter to three. So people knew that kids would start streaming back into the school into the neighborhood between three and four, maybe even five o'clock. But I think this overstructuring, I, my, my deal was I said to my kids, pick two things. And, you know, usually it was a sports thing and an activity, but I think you need that space out time. I think it is totally okay to have that unstructured Sunday or unstructured Saturday just to like uh, play with some blocks or draw a picture or, you know, whatever. I think p- kids need to know how to entertain themselves. I decried the the advent of the video in the minivan at all times. I mean, a long, long haul. I had a minivan. If I was driving from Los Angeles to San Francisco, that's six hours. Everything, everyone will be happier if you can watch a Disney video for at least two and a half hours of that. It, it, that works for everyone. But I mean, I had friends who like, they turned it on as soon as they got in the car, even if they were just going to the mall or whatever, because it was sort of a pacifier. And, and to my way of thinking, you lose that conversation between the kids if the video is going. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I'm happy to say that what you just described is pretty much my threshold as well. I joke and say everything everybody says about screen time, I have found to be true, at least for my kids. So we try to limit it as much as we can. But my family lives in Pittsburgh, so that's about a six hour ride. So when you're dealing with that, all bets are off. It's just kind of get. Yeah, no, I mean, it's unreasonable. (laughs) And the same thing is like teaching kids restaurant skills. I mean, when my kid was little, um, we we love to go to this uh, uh, Japanese restaurant. And like, you know what? He would be throwing rice all over the place and it was not good. So what we learned was one, we'd tell them that we were coming. They would put saran wrap on the table. So it was a much easier cleanup. And we also asked, please serve us the receipt when the, the bill, when the food comes. So we can sign off. You get our credit card processed. So if we have to make a hasty exit, we can make a hasty exit. But I also think it's it's realistic expectations. You cannot expect a child to sit still more than 20 minutes. So, so you have to work that either 
run run around the parking lot before you come in and say, okay, you had fun and now we've got to be quiet or have something to do once they finish eating. And I prefer that it's not the video game, but you know, a, a pack of crayons or we used to play Where's the Bean, which basically at Chinese restaurants, we'd take a wad up a little piece of um, straw paper and put it under one of the three cups. I basically play three card Monty with the teacups. Now, some some restaurants were, were okay with this. Others weren't. It was more of a family style, casual Chinese restaurant that we used to go to. But that would occupy them until the food hit the table. And then we're like, okay, now put that away. We're eating food. And then we'd ask for the, and you know, as they get older, you can say, you know, and I'm sorry, you're just going to have to listen to some boring grown up conversation for a little while. And then you push off. But I think that, you know, you, you have to understand what a kid is capable of. I think it's very, and also engage them in conversation. It makes me insane when I see a table of small children and adults and the adults are talking and talking and talking and talking and they never engage the children. You wouldn't do that to an adult friend. So it's really not fair to do it to the kids. A good point. <laughs> Actually, something that I think uh, my wife and I have to catch ourselves doing is when we'll ask the kids something about their schedule or something, the other adult will just answer. And it's like reminding yourself, like, I know the adult yeah. knows the answer. We're trying to engage the kid, but sometimes you sort of want the immediacy of answers. So you, yeah, you definitely have to step back and be able to do that. And you know what? And, and sometimes a restaurant experience goes completely sideways and you just have to make a hasty exit. You apologize, you pay the bill. One parent takes the kid out and yeah, but that's how they learn. You know, you were unpleasant. So the dinner left and we have to go home. And that's a drag because we were all really looking forward to this. But because your behavior was such, you know, it's over. We have to go home. One other thing to touch on with the technology, your example of the calculator, we've been doing a number of school episodes for obvious reasons with the craziness that is lockdowns and virtual school and how kids are able to adapt to that. But even in digging into current school program system and almost like it being structured to complete a thing and go on to the next thing, like your resume building almost in school. Do you have any thoughts about how technology has played a role in school, maybe morphing from developing your critical thinking and problem solving skills to being a taskmaster and checking the box? It's an ongoing balancing act. And and to parents, my sympathy to parents, because the landscape is shifting under your feet in real time. But I think our parents had to deal with that to a degree. And I certainly had to deal with it. And our children will have to deal with it as parents. I th I think part of it is a gut check. I, I mean, I think you, you can't, I, I don't think it's a good idea to not let kids have any technology because they have to be contemporary with their peers. Um, I think it's everything in moderation. I mean, when Facebook came on, uh, you were supposed to be 13. And so I held the line on that much to the horror of my, uh, my kids. Um, and I said, you know, I said to my daughter, look, he had to wait till you were, he was 13. So you have to wait till you're 13. She's like, Oh my God, I can't believe it. You're hor so horrible. But I, I caved on the cell phone thing because I needed it as a working mom. I needed to be able to say running five minutes late or uh, daddy called and he's going to be picking you up. Things like that. Now, okay, I'm so old. It was flip phones. I don't think you hand a fourth grader a $600 piece of equipment. Um, there are cricket phones and, and lesser phones and, and say you work towards that Apple. Okay. That is not something you get right away because guess what? They lose the phone and much easier to lose a $20 cricket phone in a week, because they'll lose it within a week. They're, oh yeah, I got it. I got this wired and off it goes or it gets run over by a bike or thrown into a lake. Um, things happen. Um, but I think that you, you, I think I've seen kids hobbled that they don't have any sense of how to navigate something because it's been this absolute. And I, th so I think it's a gut check as far as moderation. I mean, what, screen time was a, was a, a, a clean two hour thing in my household. But then once they got into middle school and a lot of their things, turn it in.com and additional materials available online. And a lot of their communications with their teacher was online. Well, that had to get a little squishy because I'm not going to say, no, you can't do your homework. Well, I know that they were like goofing around. I'd walk into the room and they change the screen. So it looked like they were working on math. You know, I know I was being played, but, um, that's part of time management. They've got to figure out how to do it. And guess what? They're going to screw up. They're going to get in trouble and they're going to learn from screwing up. I mean, I think if anything with this book, I'm trying to say is parents breathe. Your kids are going to make mistakes. 
they're going to hurt themselves. They're going to hurt people. Property is going to be damaged. Blood will be drawn, but we'll all get through it. And I mean, uh, I think that I thank my, uh, my uh, guardian angel, uh, wherever she is, that she got me through life with relatively minimal scrapes. But I, I think that a lot of things can only be learned by doing, and that is a messy process. One comment about the technology and the phones and all that, another theme that has been picked up in some of our episodes that I think is worth repeating whenever you're talking about kids is compare what we expect adults to do and see if we are expecting the same or more of our kids and go to a restaurant and watch a table of all adults and you're going to find at least one where they're sitting there staring at their phone and not talking to the people right in front of them. So oh, yeah. why in the world would you then give that piece of technology to a kid that's certainly not going to be able to resist it any better than an adult? So I think for any of those kinds of decisions purposes, think about how you use the item or experience, whatever it happens to be, and then decide if you think your kid could actually handle it or not. I agree. I think what you're striking on is walk the walk. Don't be a hypocrite. If if you're saying dinner is a phone free event, then it is. Um, I go to New York for business a lot, and there's a, a phrase called the New York stack. And what you do is you put all the cell phones in the middle, or you know, on the side, all stacked up. Whoever grabs their phone first has to buy lunch for everybody, <laughs> because the the idea is that you know we're not nobody's so critically important that you can't spend an hour with colleagues or friends. Or if something's so very pressing, then don't go to lunch. Okay, if you've got a deadline or somebody's in the hospital, then, okay, understood, hall pass, you need your phone, but that's going to distract you anyhow, so we'll have lunch with you another time. I think the other thing that I think is so crazy is that we expect our kids to be excellent in everything. I am not excellent in everything. Math was always a, a challenge for me, and what I explained to my kids is like, okay, it's called elementary education for a reason. You need to have like a groundwork in all of this. But I learned very early on that I math is not my strongest suit. Doesn't give me a hall pass not to try. But what I've said, you know, I have an accountant do that part of my life. And it doesn't mean I don't have oversight. It doesn't mean that I don't have an understanding. But I have found a specialist in my life who knows how to navigate that better. And it's a constant education. I mean, I've learned a lot. And at the same time, uh, I know that I need this person in my life. And I think that's fair. Like one of the things I wrote about in the book is that I kept reworking um, a school uh, paper. I Because I went to five different grade schools, I kept reworking my Thomas Alva Edison biography, which, you know, a purist would say, that's terrible, Sinia. You should do somebody new every single time. But let's be fair, okay? Like I'm a consultant and I issue a contract. Do I start with a blank sheet of paper? No, I do not. I have a template. You know, certain paragraphs are, are evergreen and then I build it to the specific thing. So I don't think that's entirely awful to start with a biography about Thomas Alva Edison in sixth grade. And then I was in another school and they said, okay, we need to do, everyone has to do a biography about a scientist. Well, hey, I've got the groundwork of that. But the bar was a little higher. I had to add photos. I had to add whatever. And you build and you build and you build. So I think what you want to look at is you're trying to turn out uh, a functioning 35-year-old. And I think there is the letter of the law and there is the spirit of the law. And there's a lot of room for interpretation in that. And I think you kind of set a bar for your family saying, this is how we operate. And like, oh, they'll go, well, but you know, the Joneses do this. And like, well, that's cool. That's how they operate. Your last name isn't Jones. Your name is Smith. And this is how we roll. I'm reminded of an article I read a little while back that says, yeah, what are we teaching kids and how is it setting them up for the work world? And the word that it was picking on was grit. And it's like, if you read the definition of grit, it's persistence in the face of adversity. Or in other words, you keep working even though you don't like the thing that you're doing. And hey, there's a lot of us out there when you think about your day job, that probably pretty well sums it up. And is that really what you want for your kids or society as a whole? So even your example where your kids are finding other ways to get an assignment done quicker, maybe it's not their subject and they're just trying to get it done as quickly as they possibly can. Hopefully then they're using what their strengths are and what their interests are to apply the work ethic and so on and, and so forth. Uh, another example, even for me right now, I was never a big reader. Something else that I've read when you 
here the difference between how boys learn and girls learn is it turns out i guess boys in general it's not uncommon for them to say they're not readers and what i've seen is it's because what do you remember reading mostly novels and at least this study said boys like to read nonfiction and then action things like comic books which absolutely you know fit for me and then also for myself as far as strengths and weaknesses if a lecture basically covered everything in a book if I hear something, I remember it. So my mom would get mad at me and say, you never studied, you never this and that. And then I'd still get a good grade on the test. I'm like, if I hear it, I don't need to read it. It just, that's the way my brain works. And so I basically do almost exclusively audio books, but just as an example, I feel like there's a stigma there. You know, for example, if I'll misspeak and say, oh, I read, you know, my wife will say, did you? No, you didn't. So I, I make sure to say I finished <laughs> an audio book, but, but similarly, I don't know what the protocol is right now for kids kids going through school, but gosh, if they have a certain book that they have to complete and the audio book is available, I mean, obviously they need to know how to read and comprehension and so on. Like how bad is that if it's something that they're not that interested in and need to get through a class and so on? So there, I think even there is some flexibility. Well, I, I think there's something to be said for slogging through a book. Um, my son was given crime and punishment by one of his friends. I'm like, your friend needs to lighten up. But he, to him, he got through 600 plus pages. And I think there's something to be said for slogging through a project. And I think it's important that children learn that you can struggle through something and maybe you get a B minus and gee, it would have been nice to get an A, but you know, sometimes what was the saying? Don't let the perfect get in the way of the good. And also I think the other thing kids have to understand is that nobody can give a hundred percent to everything. The big, the big lesson in life is balancing your responsibilities for uh, what's involved and what you were talking about at learning. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I think what's been humbling to me, um, just in this process of, uh, distributing this book, there's a lot of, you know, I know how to write. I've been writing my whole adult life. That's comfortable. Boy, I can do that really well. Uh, learning how to do a one sheet that has hot links and taking a video and changing the aspect ratio and downloading it and reformatting it for Facebook live thing. Okay. Uh, those were sentences I couldn't even complete. <laughs> so I think we have to be honest with ourselves that, you know, we face struggle. And I think you, if you merchandise the struggle, I mean, m uh, my son came home from college and I was trying to do a, uh, I've done websites on other platforms. I had to do one on Squarespace, which is good, but some of the, the, the way that way you have to construct it is it, there was a, a huge learning curve would be the polite way, but he literally saw me almost reduced to tears of frustration, but I got through it. And I think it's important for kids to see you struggle, whether like you can't st start the lawnmower or you're trying to hang a shelf and it's just not going well. I mean, yes, you don't have, you know, swear like a sailor in front of your five-year-old, but by the same token, you can walk away from it and start to merchandise it going like, oh, I thought this was going to be easier. This is really hard. And it, it feels bad when things are hard. I like it when I, I can figure this out. And son, or sometimes you might say, you know what, this is beyond me. I'm calling in, you know, my handyman to do this because for the life of me, I can't hang this level and it needs to be level. Yes, I, I think so. Even, in solving disagreements with somebody. Uh, as a matter of fact, we've done an episode around divorce and one of the clarifications between how to deal with an ex-spouse compared to a married couple is ex-spouse, you might have the pitfall of a child only seeing the beginning of an argument and not seeing the resolution, whereas married couple, knock on wood, hopefully <laughs> they're seeing the whole resolution and uh, so that it's not a bad thing to have a disagreement, but there's a certain way to come back and handle it. So yeah, I think that same mentality can be applied to your point to struggling through something. I had a seminal fight with my dad that he blamed me for something that I didn't do. And I could understand, you know, it was circumstantial evidence. It looked like I had done it super to nuts, but I hadn't. And he got into it with me and I was burning because it was like, you have incomplete information, but you know, like he was kind of playing the dad card. And I remember, you know, and I was a, I was like 14 or 15. So you're just sassy enough. And I remember saying to him, you know, you're not big enough to admit when you're wrong. And oh my goodness, you could have cut the silence with a knife. And <laughs> I said, can I tell you my part of this? And so he was quiet and he listened and his, I remember his face red and he said, I didn't know that part. I said, I know. And again, I mean, I sound like the perfect child. I was not. This, I, I was trembling in my shoes because standing up to your father when you're 14, 15 years old is a formidable moment. But to my dad's credit, he's like, well, that changes things. I'm sorry. 
And that meant so much to me. And so I've had situations where I'm just, uh, you know, my, my saying is don't get my Irish up. You know, I, I can be fine with really big things, but little things really get under my skin and, uh, and I'll carry on. And, but I, w- I've learned to say to my kids, this has nothing to do with you. I'm really frustrated, you know, articulate what's going on. I'm really frustrated because I've been trying to get this doctor's appointment for three days and this lady's just not returning my call or whatever it is to explain to them. Because to your point, if you only see the flare up, Okay, they know how to have a fight. They don't know how to glue it back together. And, or that some, and also sometimes things don't work out that, you know, I've, I've pitched a piece of business that I'm really excited about. And I think my proposal was wonderful. And I share that with my kids. And then I didn't get it. And I have to give voice to that going, gosh, I did my very best. I'm really proud of what I turned in, but I didn't get it. That, you know, that happens. And so I'm allowed to feel sorry. I'm entitled to my feelings. But at the same time, you know, we all have to move on. And I think that's the kind of toolkit you want to give your kids that like, I'm really unhappy that you damage your sister's bike. And, you know, maybe you're going to have to have financial participation in, in, uh, you know, you're, you're in fifth grade. You don't have enough money to buy a new stingray, but you know, maybe you have to come up with 10% of it or whatever. You got to have some skin in the game on making this right. And it's hard to be consistent. We're human. We're tired. Maybe we've had a really lousy week. Maybe we've had a really lousy month. The thing with kids is that you can always sort of etch a sketch it, that you can have a bad thing, give it a little time and then circle back and go, you know what? I'm not really proud about how I did that. Can I tell you where I was coming from? And I mean, you got to keep it short too. You don't want to go on and on and on. But I think if you think of the the touch points that you want saying, I really wanted this to happen for me. I know in my heart, I did the best I can. I'm really disappointed it didn't go my way. But I have to look at it and look at who got it and what did they give that I didn't have that I need to put into it next time? Because that's owning your emotions and also saying, I didn't have all the answers. And if I'm really honest with myself, obviously somewhere I fell short and and build from that. That I think is invaluable for kids to see you navigate. Also agree and is something that I try to tell myself as often as I can. And I might be wrong here, but I would say that that is somewhat of a newly identified skill for parents. And of course, we've been focusing on a lot of lessons that we could learn from growing up in the past decades. What do you think are things that are just way better now with the way people are taught to parent? I think the celebration of fathers is a marvelous thing. I mean, when my dad was coming up, it was considered not a good look to have a family picture on your desk. Can you imagine? Um, let alone, I mean, you know, changing diapers, what's that? I think, you know, when, when I was pregnant with my kids, my husband went to birthing classes and new dad classes and stuff because they, you know, men don't have that vocabulary. Maybe a few people have either taken care of their younger siblings or maybe babysat for a cousin or something, but there is this dearth of what's dealing with a newborn. How do you deal with a kid? And so I think it's great. And, you know, like I'll see the dads walking around with the baby Bjorn and walking the dog on Saturday or you're in the Trader Joe's and it's like the dads with the kids getting the groceries so mom can sleep in on Saturday. And that's terrific. Um, I don't think, you know, when when my parents were children, it was, you know, be seen and not heard. Like if you're going to act out, you like go to the nursery or go to the backyard or like we don't want to we don't want to know from that. And and dad was the law. And I think my my father uh, was a pretty traditional guy, but he had four daughters and he, his lesson to us was like, look, I'd love for you to be married. That'd be nice. And I'd love for you to have children, but that's not a guarantee. So you need, you need to figure out what you're good at and you need to be able to take care of yourself. That was massively progressive for someone who had, uh, all girls in the sixties and seventies. And I look at my, younger cousins who are fathers of of boy. I mean, just the fact that they go to all the games and they are, you know, they show up at parent night. That used to be like, it'd be a bunch of moms and, you know, two dads. Now you go, it's a, it's, it's close to a 50, 50 split or both parents come, or sometimes you have more than kids. You have to divide and conquer. You take care of kid one's PTA meeting and I'll take care of kid two uh, PTA meeting. So I, I think that's really marvelous. And that, um, the other thing I like is the the um, fraternity of young 
parents. I remember when I had a, I had just one kid and I was going to have a second kid and I'm in a Starbucks line and I ask another mom, like, you know, I'm thinking about a double stroller. What do you think horizontal versus, you know, front and back? And I mean, total stranger. You wouldn't say like, hey, I saw you had a Mustang out in the parking lot. What do you think? They'd think you were a weirdo. But new parents are so forthcoming with like, well, you know, we thought this and I'd like this part. And if I was going to do it over, I mean, you'd get all this information. And that was not something that happened for my parents. I was really glad that it happened for me. And I certainly see it. Um, you know, my, my kids' friends are just beginning to get married. There's not so many babies yet, but they, their involvement with smaller children and seeing, seeing that they're, that they can be a lot of different things, that the roles aren't as defined, I, I, I think is a, a healthy evolution that's getting better and better. Just to show, hopefully, I'm in that uh, dad category. Uh, I am very, very frugal, and of course, that's why we do finance on the show. And the company I happen to be working for at the time of my kid's birth had a program where you could bring your baby into the office, literally right next to you while you're working. It was originally six months, then they upped it to eight months. So the reason I mention being so money conscious, that was my first thought is, yeah, I'm going to do this because that's daycare I'm not paying for. Uh, but then very quickly, I realized that, and of course, it wasn't easy to actually get your work done and so on. But that's time that was well spent to say the least and was a great bonding experience and so on. And hopefully even kind of kicked me off in the right direction as far as uh, being extra involved as a parent. And again, I, I can go off on tangents about like business travel and stuff like that too, that I think used to be expected. I think it's important for children to see you in a different dynamic other than the household. I remember my when we started out living in New York City and then with four kids, we moved to the suburbs. But my mom had us take the train and get off at Grand Central Station and walk to my dad's office and take the elevator up to his office. And and I can remember like my hands on the desk. That's how little I was. And here's daddy's desk and this is where he goes. And it was fantastic to understand like, okay, that's why he's gone so long. Cause wow, that train ride took a while. And that was a pretty big walk. And he's in this tall building and he's in this office with a desk and these are the people he works with. I think that's a really amazing thing for kids to see. And we were, I was joking with a, an, an, another friend that like, he's like, God, when we were kids, nobody knew what their dad did. Your dad just disappeared in the morning and showed up at dinner. And, you know, okay, I guess that's what dads do. So I, I think it's really important for seeing that. And also I think the thing is, is like my dad was one of those guys who was cutting the lawn uh, in the morning and, you know, then wanted to watch a football game or something. But I definitely got the get the the work done first and then enjoy yourself. But he didn't treat us like princesses. We were out. We had to either pull weeds out of the sidewalk or we had to uh, trim the bush or, you know, things that were age appropriate that we could do. And what I translated that with my kids, we didn't really have a lawn. We lived in a canyon. So our backyard was basically gravel, but we had a garden. And so we would always go to the gardening center and buy like a flat of petunias or whatever. I mean, really simple stuff, but we'd always buy two boxes of ladybugs and we would have ladybug liberation day because I explained to them that ladybugs are gardeners and they take care of the bad bugs and, you know, keep the flowers pretty. And, you know, we want to, we, we want these guys in our, our thing. And of course they're beautiful and you open it up and see all these like little ladybugs fly away. But I think that sort of showed both the work of it that you have to go, you know, flowers don't just appear. You need to either plant seeds or plant a seedling and you have to take care of it. And that, you know, there's other parts of the world that take care of this thing that we're, we want a pretty garden, but you know what? Ladybugs can do things that I can't do. So I'm going to, I'm going to dial some ladybugs into the equation. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Sinia, I think that's about all the questions that I have for you. Before I let you go, do you want to go ahead and give your contact information, of course, where folks can get a copy of the book? And then if you happen to have any events or promotions? I think the easiest thing to do is if you uh, just Google me, um, Confessions of a Helmet-Free Childhood. Uh, the book is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Target, Walmart, all the, the usual suspects. Again, I would say that this should be a fun read, both for people who lived through it or had parents who lived through it. I have cousins who have younger children and have read it. We've only got one bad word in the whole <laughs> whole book, and which we've already discussed. Um, but I think it's a fun read. And I think if anything, like I said, I hope in reading my stories, you will tell your children yours. Very cool. Well, I appreciate you joining me today and we'll be in touch. It was delightful. Thanks so very much. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider giving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. You can also subscribe on Apple, Spotify, or all other major podcasting applications to be notified of our latest episode. 
You can also join our conversation at suburbanfolk.com or any social media site, including Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at the handle Suburban Folk. Thanks for listening.